This video is part one of the unit one notes. We will be covering the scientific method and estimation. Francis Bacon was a British lawyer and philosopher who published Novum Organum Scientiarum in 1621. Bacon argued that a clear system of scientific inquiry would assure man's mastery over the world, and he is given credit for developing the modern scientific method. The scientific method is a logical approach to solving problems which involves testing. The first step that you would need to take is to observe an object or phenomenon, and this may involve the collecting of data. Then you would ask a question related to an observation and identify the problem to be considered. Next, you would create a hypothesis, a tentative, testable statement, and you would design an experiment. Then you would perform an experiment and gather data that pertains to the questions. Finally, you would draw conclusions regarding the outcome, and then revise the experiment or repeat the experiment to confirm results. And you can see all that summarized in our flow chart here. Two concepts that are often mixed up are scientific law and theory. A scientific law describes how nature behaves but does not describe why nature behaves in a particular way, whereas a theory explains why nature behaves in the way described by natural law. It answers additional questions raised during the process and predicts the results of future experiments. A theory can never be upgraded to a law. Here we are going to be going through a hypothetical experiment involving a golf ball and a tennis ball using the scientific method. The first thing we would need to do is make observations for each of these two objects. Now if you look at a tennis ball, you might notice its color, it's green. It has a fuzzy texture on the surface. It's round. A tennis ball would bounce if you threw it at the ground. It condenses when squeezed. And we know that it is larger than a golf ball, since we are clearly comparing these two objects. For the golf ball, we could say that it's white. It's smooth, but it has little dimples along the surface. It is also round, and it also bounces. It does not condense when you squeeze it, and it is significantly smaller than a golf ball. Now that we've made these observations, we are going to continue and come up with a question. The observation that I'm going to focus on for this experiment is the color. So I know that the tennis ball is green and the golf ball is white. And I'm going to come up with a question based on that observation. Does color have an effect on whether or not an object sinks or floats in water? My hypothesis is that color does have an effect on the ability of an object to sink or float in water. I believe green objects will float and white objects will sink. Now my reasoning behind this is that I know the word white begins with the letter W, which is at the end of the alphabet, which is kind of like the bottom. I also know that grass is green and grass grows up towards the sun. Therefore, white objects would go down and green objects will go up. For my experiment, I place both the white golf ball and the green tennis ball in water. I see that the white ball sinks to the bottom and the green ball floats. Therefore, I draw a conclusion, which is that green objects will float in water and white objects will sink. Now you have to think to yourself, do these results make sense? And of course they don't. We know that the real reason why an object would sink or float in water is based on its density. So what went wrong with our experiment? Because based on what I did, it looks like color had some kind of an impact here. The answer is the difference between controls and variables. A control is a condition which is constant within an experiment. And ideally, you want to have as many controls as possible. An example of a control that I did have in the experiment was the fact that they were both balls. One was a golf ball, one was a tennis ball. But the fact that they were balls was a control. A variable is a condition that changes within the experiment. And ideally, you want as few as possible. It should be the thing you were testing. So in a perfect scenario, the only variable in my experiment should have been the color. So maybe I had an experiment where I was just using a white tennis ball and a green tennis ball, 
or a green golf ball and a white golf ball. Because I had additional variables, which could be the texture of the ball, one was fuzzy, one was smooth, the size of the ball, the tennis ball was significantly larger, uh, one was hollow and one wasn't, any of those could have been a contributing factor to the outcome of the experiment that we saw. Here are some key terms. Uh, qualitative data. The word qualitative is very similar to quality. This is information which has no measurable quantity, so we are not dealing with any numbers. Examples of qualitative data that we could take in an experiment could be the color, odor, or shape of an object. Quantitative data sounds very similar to quantity, or dealing with numbers. So this is information which is measured in numbers. Examples could be something like temperature, pressure, or volume. The system is the subject which has been selected for study, and the surroundings is everything in the universe which is outside of that system. Here we've come to the first checkpoint question for our notes. For each of our checkpoint questions that you're going to reach, you need to write out the solutions to these in your notebook. How could each term fit into the golf ball and tennis ball experiment? Well, for qualitative, This could be the color. We noticed that one of the objects was green and the other object was white. We could also say the texture would be qualitative data, whether one object was smooth versus whether it was fuzzy, and its ability to bounce or not bounce. So those are all examples of qualitative data. For quantitative data, I could say the volume of water that was inside of the beaker that was used in the experiment. That is something that we could actually measure. The temperature of the water will be another example of quantitative data. We could use the size of the ball. We could also measure the height that the ball was within the water. All right, how could we use system versus surroundings within our experiment? The system is whatever we were actually studying. So this would be the ball in the water. So I would say the beaker, the water, and the ball. Those would be all the things that were considered part of our system. And the surroundings would be everything outside of that, which may or may not have an effect on the experiment. We could say the air. Maybe the air pressure or the air temperature had some kind of an effect on the outcome. Of course, the person doing the experiment would be part of the surroundings too. Uh, maybe the town or the state that you're in. Maybe altitude has some kind of an effect. So anything that is outside of the system that you are actually studying would be considered the surroundings. All right, the next concept that we are going to be covering in part one is estimation. When estimating a value, you should write out as far as your instrument can measure with certainty, and then add one final digit where you estimate. And this does not apply to digital readouts. So for example, here we have an electronic balance. This is an instrument that we're going to be using a lot in this course. The electronic balance measures to two places after the decimal. So you are always going to record your measurement to two places after the decimal. Uh, this one, you do not have to add any kind of extra digit after it. It's doing the estimation for you. But for any other object, such as a beaker, or a graduated cylinder, a thermometer, or a ruler, you need to estimate based on what you can actually see. So for example, in this beaker, you're going up by hundreds. So we have 100, 200, 300, and so on. You can see the hundreds place, but they don't show you any marks for the tens place. So if my water level was somewhere here, slightly above the 100 mark, I wouldn't record that measurement as 100. I also couldn't say that it is 105.27. 
there's no way that I could be that precise. So what I do is estimate one past what I could see. I can see that it's somewhere between 100 and 150. So maybe I estimate that as 110 milliliters. Now each object that you use to measure might have a different level of precision. So for example, this graduated cylinder, here we have seven and eight, and each of those little tick marks represents the tenths place or one place after the decimal. So if I measure anything using this graduated cylinder, I have to have two places after the decimal. So let's say that it is exactly on this 7.5 line. While it may be 7.5, I can't record it as that. Based on the way that this device is set up, I need to go two places after the decimal. So if I believe that it was exactly on that 0.5, I could put a zero afterwards, 7.50. If I thought that it was maybe a little bit higher than the 7.5 line, I could call it 7.2, uh, sorry, 7.52 or 7.53. If it was slightly below that line, maybe 7.47 or 7.45. The last digit might be a little different from somebody else that does the same measurement because it's estimated. Okay, here we have two examples where we are measuring the same, uh, the same leaf, but the ruler is changing. So in this first example, our ruler is going up by ones. And in the second example, it's going up by the little tick marks, which are the tenths place. So if I were to measure this, I draw a line straight down from the tip of the leaf. I say that it's somewhere between three, point, uh, sorry, three and four. So an acceptable measurement could be 3.5 centimeters. If your lab partner had 3.4 centimeters or 3.6 centimeters, those would be equally valid because we can't determine exactly where it falls. Now, if I'm using this ruler, I'm going to draw this straight down. And let's say that I think it falls somewhere between these two tick marks. And the line isn't exactly straight, but we'll estimate based on this. So this would be 3.1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So now I think it's a little bit past the 0.5. So maybe I say that this is 3.52 centimeters or 3.53 centimeters. Either of these answers would be acceptable. Okay, finally, we have estimation using a meniscus. When measuring the volume of a liquid, be sure to measure from the bottom of the curve. So here, if I have the curve with a little bit of water adhering to the glass on either side, I wanna look at the very bottom when I'm recording my value. Now, there is a reason for this. If we look at the amount of area that we're missing out on, we have a small amount of water that we're not really taking into account. So our measurement isn't exactly true. But if I were to estimate based on the top, this area is significantly larger than the area I'm missing out on. So we can kind of consider this the lesser of two evils. So that's the reason why we're measuring from the bottom of the meniscus. That is the conclusion of part one of our unit one notes. When we come back for part two, we are going to cover precision versus accuracy and calculating percent error.